Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, coming on Power Talk. Thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And, you know, just when you think that you've, you know, discovered everybody and tracked down people, you realize that there's just so much more uh, that is required <laughs> to continue to excavate uh, our cultural heritage and the musical landscape of our co- country at one time. And I get a chance today to connect with um, a cat who uh, really was uh, steeped in melodic improvisation. Uh, some people would call that jazz, and he was around a lot of the original masters of the music. And he found his way into uh, the California studio scene as a guitar player, playing parts that served the songs for many, many albums on Motown and jazz records with Cannonball Adderley, R&B with the Jackson 5, and ultimately at the end of the day, <clears throat> uh, my show is about promotion, uh, not preservation, about how real music is made, what are the most effective qualities of leadership on the bandstand, um, how to overcome adversity as a road dog and the lineage of all musics don peak welcome to the jake feinberg show thank you jake i am honored to be here it's an honor my friend i uh you know i just wanted you to talk a little bit about um you know the idea of guys like tedesco um and then um you know Howard Roberts, and and how they didn't really, they didn't like rock, they didn't like rock music, they could play it, but I find it very interesting that like, you came along at a time when um, you and your brethren were a little bit more adept at arranging rock tunes, just because it was more like in your pocket and i wanted you to just if if, the best you can remember you know sort of the attitude that those bop purists barney kessel's in there as well you know the 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 attitude they had towards rock music and and sort of how you guys you louis shelton larry carlton those cats how you took that music that burgeoning rock music and and really made it come alive well first of all you know rap did not exist in those days um Tommy Tedesco said it best one day. He said, you know, he said, I just try to, to play ignorant like a 13-year-old. I try to, I think about, I try to play like someone that doesn't know anything. Wow. That's like a Miles Davis. Miles Davis said that to John McLaughlin during, uh, I think it was Bitches Brew or maybe in a silent way. He said something to him to the effect, play like you don't know how to play the guitar and he got mclaughlin yeah. figured it out but that's amazing to, yeah. that he that that was tedesco's line man tedesco said it and uh you have to understand that i started out very late uh the kids nowadays already know how to play all the songs that i played on when they're 10 i started playing when i was 16 and a half and rapidly started playing in nightclubs and ended up with Elvis Presley's stand-in, Lance Legault, at a club in the valley called The Crossbow. And Elvis would come in about three nights a week with Dorsey Burnett and Jerry Burnett. Oh my and they God. would go up and they'd sit up in the balcony and we'd play our music. And, and Lance Legault loved Ray Charles. So he made us learn the Ray Charles songs absolutely note for note. And that came in later. That helped me out later. But so I'd go upstairs on the break, and Elvis would be sitting there, and he'd go, "Hello, Don." <laughs> and he was a, he was the nicest guy. And and I was 19 years old, 1959. Wow. And then, and then the word came down that Everly Brothers were looking for a guitar player, and Marshall Lieb, from the Teddy Bears, from Phil Spector's Teddy Bears came to me, Marshall said, Don, I want to take you over to introduce you to the Everly Brothers. And I said, Marshall, I'm, I'm, (laughs) I'm really just a beginner. And he said, come with me. And so I ended up at 21 years old as lead guitar player with the Everly Brothers touring Europe and the United States. And it was 
quite stunning, you know, to be with the Everleys because they were at the height of their career. They were fantastic. Oh, my God. And we got to England, and we played a, a little tour, and then we came back to the U.S. and toured the U.S. Then we went back to England, the beginning of 1962, and the tour had been expanded. And now there was a young band who was going to open up for us called the Rolling Stones. Mm-hmm. And so we were up on stage at the London Palladium, and the Stones are, are finishing their act. The they, Everly Brothers hand me their two beautiful J200, you know, dreadnought guitars. I tune up the guitars. And I look backstage and I see some guys with really long hair, shaggy guys. And I said to one of the stagehands, who are those guys? And they said, those are the Beatles. They're friends of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and so, so now I go out on stage and I'm playing with the Everleys. And we find out we're going to Germany. And we're going to play in Hamburg. And there's a little place in the Reeperbahn. The Reeperbahn was the red light district where all the prostitutes were upstairs, and they would beckon to you from their windows. And there was a little nightclub there called the Star Club in Hamburg hmm. on a street called Herbertstrasse. And we traded sets. There were three little kind of half-round bandstands, and it was the Everly Brothers, the Rolling Stones, and the Beatles, and we traded sets with that, each other. That is absolutely remarkable. So, so people don't know that I'm... I knew those guys back in the day. And and there was a guy, we went to a nightclub one night in England, in London, and there was a band playing, and they were pretty good. We were finished with our concert, so we sat down, and we were all three of us, me and Joey Page and Chuck Blackwell, were all wearing the same suit. So clearly we must be a band or something. Mm -hmm. And the guys that were up on the stage finished their set, and they came over and they said, hi. And we said, hi, come on, sit down. And they said you know, who are you? And I said, well, we're with the Everly Brothers. And they were completely aghast. You you play with the Everly Brothers? Yeah, we're the band. And say, well, my name is Albert Lee. And this is my friend Eric Clapton. And we all sat together in 1962 in London. And I told Eric Clapton and Albert Lee about B.B. King and about the blues and about Blind Lemon Jefferson and, and, you know, T-Bone Walker. And, and so we had that conversation, and Eric Clapton later on wrote about me in his autobiography, saying that he had heard me play with the Everleys and he thought I was talented. And Keith Richards wrote about me and said, oh, yeah, Don Peake with the Everly Brothers. So that was... That, I mean, were you, is it fair to say that... I mean, because the folklore, I mean, I was born in 78, but it, the idea is the folkloric, you know, is that, is that, um, you know, the, 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 the way that the, you know, black masters of blues got on the radar was because of the British invasion in this country. But you, you did, was Clapton already aware of when you were talking to him, he had obviously knew who those cats were. Do you think you hipped him to that? To the to black I think, blues. I think that, as we used to say in the community, I think I pulled his coat to this. Pulled his coat? Are you kidding me? I mean, this is really important, Peak, because the word, I mean, what it comes down to is that, it, I mean, at least the story goes that, you know, when those cats came here, the stones and, you know, clapped, like, they're the ones that were like, oh, yeah, our heroes are all these amazing blues masters that, were basically, you know, they were, um, they were working musicians, but they were certainly not glorified in this country. And you're saying that you went over there and pulled your coat, pulled Clapton's coat to, uh, to, to the cats. Yeah. But not only that, the tour in 1962 included Bo Diddley. Wow. Little Richard. I mean, this, this was the reason the Rolling Stones used that tambourine but it's because Bo Diddley's guy, Jerome, was playing tambourine all the time on stage. And, and, and little Richard was playing the crazy piano stuff and, and running around backstage in a negligee. <laughs> I, I'd never seen that Was this 1959, or is that what it is? What year? No, 60, 62. 62. This is and I, super I have the program. I can show you the program. I believe of it, the man. Don Arden tour. 
and there's Little Richard, and there's Bo Diddley, and Jerome, and and so those guys, we took the the stuff over there. You know, I mean, you do you agree with? I mean, it's hard for you being somebody who was a major player in it, but that sort of flies in the face of the way history has been represented in music history as far as when those cats, you know, Muddy and, and Wolf and and those guys, when they finally got their due was when Mayall and Clapton and the Beatles and they all came over here. But, I mean, that's, you well, don't... Well, that may yeah. be accurate later on, but in, night, in the 60s, we were touring England, you know, and, and we brought our music there. Absolutely. I, I'm curious about, you know, I think that one of the issues going on in, I mean, you know, setting aside the pandemic is just, um, you know, I don't, I mean, do you think you can truly codify the language of jazz? I mean, everybody is going to the academy now to get a degree and there's no guarantee that there's any work available once you get a degree. If you go back to the first yeah, year, true. Berkeley School of Music was in business. It was a one-room schoolhouse. Guys like Charlie Mariano would come off the road because the road was eating him alive, but he was already a professional, established musician. He'd go to either clean up or he'd go to learn a new instrument, and then he'd get back on the road and, and keep and make records. And, right. and, 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 and now it's more about like learning a language within the academy and you have cats coming out uh, who sound like they're professors instead of themselves. So you have a homogenization of sound where you started at 16, wound up at a certain period of time in our history when, I don't want to say skiffle player, it's not a negative term, but cats were picking up instruments and sell, a lot of self-taught street scholars. And I just feel like that was the magic of the time, and that's why everybody had their individual sound. And I just wonder if you, um, well, it's a two-part question. Were you ever academically trained in music, and do you believe that in the current situation that musical vocabulary can grow within the four walls of the academy? All right. Well, those are, that's a very long and, and complicated question. Let's back up a little bit Sure. to, to the young Don Peake who got hired to play guitar for Jackie Lee Cochran, a rockabilly guy. Sure. And we and we played Bebop Alula. And I could play the shit out of Bebop Alula <laughs> in the key of A. But when we got up on stage with the band, the guys said to me, "What else do you know?" And I didn't know anything else. So they started writing out chord charts for me. And I couldn't read some of those chords. I C major 7th, what's that? So I went in Hollywood to the Clara Joyce Sherman School of Music and teaching there was a fabulous guitar player named Ray Pullman. Oh, sure. Now, Ray, Ray Pullman turned out to be one of the first call bass players in the Wrecking Crew. But at that time, he was teaching guitar at Clara Joyce Sherman and I started studying with him. And so I suddenly found some new chords and new ways to play. And then... Uh, I met Barney Kessel, and I studied with Barney Kessel, and then I met Howard Roberts, and he, you know, taught before he started the Guitar Institute. You know, Howard had written out a bunch of arpeggios and interesting stuff for me to study. So I believe that what happens is that a musician, first of all, has to learn from others. And even if it's, if it's on the bandstand, or in my case, you know, I went and took lessons from these guys, and then I met Joe Pass, and I took lessons from Joe Pass. And out of each of those guys, each of those fabulous players, I learned something, and it it changed me. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, you're. Would you say that? Um, like, can you give an example of what somebody like? I mean, you weren't listening to their records. You were learning from them in the flesh. Is that right? Right. Right. Well, I was also listening to Wes Montgomery, and, you know, I was listening to Charlie Mingus, and I was listening to a lot of music. Well, I guess here's the Ray point. Charles. is that You know what it is? Like, like Joe Sample showed up at Wes Montgomery's house in Indianapolis one day, and he was working on some tune. Uh, i trying to remember the name of it. 
caravan or something. No, it wasn't caravan, but uh, and Joe's like, "Well, how did you just play that chord?" And Wes is like, "Well, I have no idea." And he's like, "Well, how did you play yeah. that chord?" He's like, well, "I have no idea." He's like, "You mean to tell me that you're playing all this beautiful music and you don't have a clue technically what you're doing?" And he's like, "I have no idea." And the point is that. Um, that there were no schools, man. There was no codif. Yeah. That you, there was no r- a playbook. I mean, outside of North Texas and and Berkeley, yeah, and, North Texas State, of course. Right, and I just I wanted you to, as best you can, going back to the young Don Peak, the idea of how because you can feel pretty confined and boxed in today. Someone's going to say, "Oh, you know, we we got to play this rock beat, or we got to play this kind of way in order to fit right. into this style." When you could just lay it out and i mean did you feel um emotionally did you did you feel liberated when you got in because you could truly just play yourself obviously you had to play parts but i just feel like the um intellectualization and the stratification of music has really hurt vocabulary and i just wanted you to talk a little bit about you know your feelings how how ebullient and and free you might have felt at that time when you got into the studios and realized there was no rule book. Well, let's back up a little to when I was 19 and I was walking down the hall at LA city college. I was an engineering major and I was walking down the hall and I heard the jazz band rehearsing and it was like a siren calling a sailor on a (laughs) ship. And I pulled, I went down the hall and I stuck my head in the door and they were, there was this, you know, four trumpets, four trombones, five saxes, bass drums, piano. And I said, do you need a guitar player? And they said, yes. And so I learned how to read charts and learned how to play with a big band when I was 19. When I went on the road with the Everly Brothers, that was very helpful because they needed somebody to help them with some of their music. We'd Sometimes we'd play at a club where there'd be some some horns would sit in with us, too. So now I come back. Everly Brothers broke up in 1963 on stage with me standing there. Wow. And we finished the tour. We came back. And I was now completely on my own. And Phil Spector started bringing me into the studio to play. With, and I played with the Righteous Brothers on You've Lost That Loving Feeling. And again, because I could read charts. I could play, but then I could also invent some parts for myself. And and the guys, you know, everybody was very friendly, and Barney Kessel was there, because Phil loved Barney Kessel, and Howard Roberts was there. Mm-hmm. So the Wrecking Crew was kind of a school for me, because I was hanging out with these amazing musicians. Barney Kessel came in one day, he said, God, he said, guys, on the way over here, I was so hungry, I ate an octave and a half of ribs. <laughs> Dude, those guys, I mean, what what made, I mean, as best you can, what made, I always, I just interviewed a drummer from New York, he's from Utica, but he, uh, and he wound up playing with Bobby Darren right around the time that you were playing with the Everly Brothers, Ronnie Zito, and he, he talked about, you know, the guys before him, uh, Everett Barksdale, and um, you know, there were, there were the before Purdy, before Chuck Rainey, before that, that crew. I mean, and, and, you know, can you talk about what made those cats like really the essence of the Kessels and the Tedescos and the, and the guys that came up truly when jazz, whatever that word means, was America's popular music and how whimsical, I guess here's the point. I mean, it seems to me whether it's Joe Pass or it's Barney, Howard Roberts, this goes on and on. You know, those guys took what they did seriously, but I don't think they took themselves that seriously. Some guys did, but I'm just saying there was... Well, no, Barney Kessel, Barney Kessel was a, an intellect. Yes. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. Wow. And although he played bebop with Charlie Parker, and he played with Lady, Ho- you know, Lady Day, Billie Holiday, he also... You know, you know, the Julie London Crimea River is Barney Kessel. Booby doll. Bree dee dee dee. That's Barney Kessel. Wow. And he he was a, a great improviser, but he was also an intellect, as I said. And what he did was 
he arranged the opera Carmen for for jazz. I mean, he he wrote scores. He he practiced. I knew his sons, you know, because Phil Spector always brought Barney's kids in also. And Barney would go in the back room. David Kessel told me this. And he'd be there with a metronome practicing and speeding it up and speeding it up because that's what he wanted. He wanted to be able to play bebop, you know, at the speed that the beboppers were playing it. Wow. And so, you know, Barney was a brilliant, and, and Howard too. Howard was a brilliant man. Oh, my God. These guys yeah. are like the, I mean, though, and, and throw pass. Pass pass had, now, pass was the only one of those that had addiction problems. I can't. I can't speak to that because he was at Synanon. He was at Synanon. I mean, there's a very famous album called uh, "Sounds of Synanon." I know that. And Pass is on that album. It's unbelievable. I studied with. I studied with Joe Pass after he got out of Synanon, and I was well aware of of that situation. But he was a fabulous man and a a gentle man, and so creative and amazing. So and he once sent me to sub for him, which was probably the greatest compliment of my life. Um, he, there was a gig that he was supposed to do, and he couldn't make it, and he sent me. What was and the I gig? Thought, what was the gig, man? This is unbelievable. The, the Paige Kavanaugh Trio. Whoa, dude! Paige Kavanaugh was a fabulous piano player, kind of an a la George Shearing. Oh my God! And who was the drummer? And was I, there a drummer? Uh, I don't remember the drummer's name or the bass player. It could have been Jack Bruce on bass. On upright. But, yeah. It definitely was Jack anyway, Bruce. Don P. cooking the groove with Jack Bruce on upright. Unreal, then. Yeah. So, Holy so there cow. I was. I mean, you, you, you know, the, so, yeah, go ahead. Continue, please. I was just going to say that a lot of different music was being thrown at me. Um, in high school, I started playing just as I was graduating high school. And Henry Franklin Sr., the captain would throw me into a big Cadillac with a bunch of guys and take me to a gig. Now, I was just starting, but Henry Franklin thought I could was learning, you know. So they would take me to these gigs, and we would play it. Everyone was black except me, as usual. And they would just throw me in the back of a Cadillac with a bunch of guys, and off we'd go. And so I have got a lot of influences. When I played with the Everly Brothers, we would show up in Minneapolis. That was the hub of the tour. And we would be at this funky hotel, and the Everleys would we would do our concert, and then we'd come back, and then I would come downstairs with my guitar and stand by the curb, and pretty soon a car would pull up with a bunch of black guys in it, and they would yell, "Hey Jim," and I would jump in the car with them, and they would drive me across the railroad tracks to the other side of Minneapolis, where the black community was, and I met Muddy Waters there. And I and I played the blues with these guys, and then in the daytime I was a white guy. <laughs> Dude, that is. Wait, hold on. I'm, my my jaw is on the floor because I started my show ten years ago, and one of my first guests and one of my dearest dearest friends is Henry the Skipper Franklin. Oh, you're kidding! I I, I and I and I cannot. And when you said L.A. City College, I flashed. To Henry because he was there and uh, with and he was this is a little bit later he was linking up he was playing in a Latin jazz band with Roy Ayers and Carl Burnett yeah Roy Ayers I remember okay so so like I cannot believe that you knew his father who was a big band leader and ran the band out of the back of his house taught Henry how to tap dance I cannot believe Don Peak that you knew. He was called the captain. Yeah, okay. He wears a, wears a like a nautical cap. No. Henry Franklin Senior went to L.A. High School, and we graduated together in 1958. I, no, I want to be clear. We're talking. You're not talking about his father. You're talking about Henry. You're talking about the skipper. Yeah. So, so it, was, it was the skipper. The the, the 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 skipper at home. That's Henry Franklin. He lives, you know, and and so you graduated from the same high school in '58. Yeah. Oh my God, that's insane! And I, he just he he just used to include me in the band, and and I I you know I just later on I called him up. I said Henry, I said man, do you remember you used to throw me in the car with the guys when we were in high school and take me to a gig? 
he said, well, I don't remember, but it sounds like something I would do. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he, he let me stay at his house, um, uh, and we threw a concert honoring the late gene russell i don't know if that cat the piano player um yeah i knew who i knew who he was right so he never really he passed he started the black jazz label which henry was on along with a lot of other cats and we threw this concert in lamert park you know 10 years ago honoring gene russell and the skipper was i mean i am so blown away i just think that that is so magical that you and he was playing upright with you. Yeah, of course. yeah. And so, so I because there was, um, so I, did you? My God, my I am just totally floored right now. I mean, you, you would say that um, that you were down in that you would go to Memory Lane. Would you go into uh, Watts um, to the Black Clubs? Uh, oh, oh yeah, Thompson. Yeah, we would we would play at, at um, just all these funny clubs, but we'd also play at parties. You know, we'd just go to somebody's house and play in their backyard. <laughs> sounds know, like sounds like school, the age man. of COVID right now. You know, you can play out. Well, in, it was high school. You know. Yeah, totally. Um, I want to tell you something about Lamert Park, please. Ray Charles and the Raylettes, the girls always have those fabulous human hair wigs that they wear. And they get them in Lamert Park on Crenshaw. There's two beautiful human hair wig stores side by side, right around 39th and Crenshaw in Lamert Park. And these wigs are not cheap. These are, are serious. And I heard two of the Ray Letts one day. I, I played with Ray Charles for 10 years, from 1964 to 1974. So I was 24 when I joined Brother Ray. I was 34, and Ray was 34. Anyway, the two Raylettes are talking, and one girl says to the other, Girl, did you see her? She had a piece of Crenshaw on her head. <laughs> but, but the fact you even know where Lamert Park is, is is quite amazing. Well, I'm going to read off these, I'm, I, you know, because there was this band called the Afro Blues Quintet, Jack uh-huh. Jack Folks was in it. Uh, uh-huh. Did you uh, Joe Diaguaro, uh and then Bill H- William Henderson? Did you know William H- Bill Henderson too? He wound up playing with yes. with Farrell. Yes, I went to LA City College with him. Dude, I cannot. I I peak. You're blowing my mind right now. I mean, <laughs> is you know, listen. We have a game on this program called Name That Voice. I want you to take a listen to this, pay attention to the content, and then we'll come back and break it down. Okay. Well, there were a lot of modal things that he was he was into. Now, I could I could handle that and understand that. But if you have to learn chord changes uh, on a chordal instrument, such as a guitar or whatever, or it, it didn't have to be a chordal instrument actually, uh, uh, if you needed to run through the changes and play what was uh, within that chord and solo off of it, that's a, a little bit of a task. Yeah, certainly in the beginning, because you have to you have to understand, and the the way that the chord changes might move, you have to be able to understand that, and know what that's doing. You want to take a guess at who that is? It's probably a uh, a cat you played with on many sessions. That's David T. Walker. Ding ding ding! That was my first interview with David T. from twenty. 20- 17 and and i and he and i sorry it wasn't in, in the right context but he was talking about going to see coltrane at a place called the zebra lounge and uh yeah yeah and he said that um <clears throat> his friends got up he was not confident enough to get up and play what he, train was playing at the time he kind of regrets yeah. that but i i'm curious about um your like you know, were you, did you understand, like, for instance, an album, like, when I interviewed McLaughlin, he said that it took him a year to understand what was going on in Love Supreme. And I'm just curious about you, like, in that modal period, once you got out of the Everly Brothers, and, you know, obviously you were already ensconced in the studio, so you were able to sing for your supper, but, I mean, as far as, like, the, 
the spiritual jazz of that time, did how quickly were you able to get your ear around that music? Well, let's back up just a little. Yeah, you said that three times. I, I love that. Yeah, you keep saying that. It's so great. Go ahead. Continue. <laughs> yeah. David T. Walker, the most beautiful human being, <laughs> the greatest guitar player, played with Lou Rawls all those years. Dude, I want to tell you but, something. I want to tell you this story before you go on. Um Okay. Uh, Actually, they, they say before we go another further. Before we go another further, he said, he said that um, I asked him about the wah wah pedal, and he said that when he first started using it, your 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 right your man Ray Charles, he was on the road with Ray Charles, and Ray wanted and Ray wanted to take the wah wah pedal apart and play it with his hands. He took the thing yeah. apart and was playing with his hands. I just thought that was yeah. really hysterical, you know. Go ahead, continue. There, there was a whole period there where Brother Ray got an electric piano and was able to bend notes for the first time. Oh, my, dude, so, where are the but, tapes but of that stuff, man? David Keith. Yeah. 1963, I'm on tour with April Stevens and Nino Tempo, Deep Purple, and we end up in Florida, in Miami, at the Peppermint Lounge, and the band before us was the Kinfolks band with David T. Walker. I know it, Chitlin Circuit. Well, that's right, the Chitlin Circuit. So I'm there, and I meet David T. Walker, and we just fell in love. And to this very day, we are dear friends. I lo This is warming my heart, dude. Uh, this is the greatest story of all time. Hmm. So David T. comes in, Freddie Perrin passes out the music, and Diana Ross walks in with a little short, very good looking young black we say now we say african american and his name was michael jackson wow. and diana ross says hi don i said hi and she said we're going to record michael jackson he's 11 years old and we think he's going to be the next motown with the jackson five so freddie perrin passes out the music louis shelton is sitting there and david t is sitting there joe sample is on piano and Wilton Felder is on bass, Gene Pello on drums, and the music was bom ba da ba dee bom ba da bom ba da ba da 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 bom 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 ba ba dee 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 bom. So I'm playing that an octave higher than Wilton, and that's I want you back. Oh, and David oh. T waits. He waits eight bars, and then he comes in with his ba ba da do da da. But the song starts with Louis Shelton playing octave A flat. Dude, so Shelton. Was, I mean, I just did my second interview with him, and he was. He, we were talking about those Gene Pello. Well, most people don't know it was him uh, playing. They, people think it's Ed Green, but it was, it was Gene on drums. And yes, it was. Now I want I want you to break this down because <laughs> this is so important. My generation is like obsessed with post production and overdubbing and sending parts via electronics. Um, and you're and telling click tracks. Don't forget click tracks. Well, I mean that's a whole other beast. But I'm just saying the idea of you, Louie, and Walker filled in those played your different parts, but you were all hitting it at the same time. Absolutely. We were all in the same room. Can you talk we about why it, the magic... There's, listen, as Duke Ellington... I think it was Duke. There's only two letters that separate magic and music. And so I want you to put us inside a room like that with Shelton. Obviously, Michael was a great talent beyond. And his family. We all, we all noticed. We knew it. 1969, this was. And we all knew he was going to be a star. Absolutely. I just, my, my, um, you know, part of what made these cats stars was because of the se the studio sharks like you guys. And I, Thank and you. I wanted, yeah, it's true. I, and I wanted you to talk about the magic that can exist and occur when people are playing off each other in the studio live. With an eye contact where you can see each other, you know, what's happening. You know, we, uh, by the way, you have to understand that we loved each other. There was such heart and such, you know, I mean, the spontaneity was there, but also being able to have a piece of music and read it. And, and you know, Freddie Perrin was such a genius. And 
we just loved each other. We just made that music, and we and we were serious, like deadly serious, because you know if this has to do with the multi-track recordings. Yeah. In the old days, when we recorded "You've Lost That Loving Feeling," it was on a three-track machine that the Beach Boys loaned to to Gold Star. <laughs> so, so the band was mixed together, and then put on the track. We didn't go back later and remix. Wow. The Gene Page put the strings on it, and the Righteous Brothers sang on it. Three tracks. And so now there's a lot of guys around the studios that were really nice guys, and, you know, a lot of back slapping going on. And suddenly they brought in an 8-track, and then they brought in a 16-track. Now the 24-track. By the way, I'm sitting in my studio next to a Sony MCI 24-track, Real to real, and <laughs> anyway, twenty-four tracks. They could now stop and solo the track. They could say, "Hey, I wonder what Don did," and they could play me for three and a half minutes by myself. And so, what happened was some of the guys started disappearing because they weren't hiring them anymore, because now they could separate them and isolate them and hear what they were doing, and some of it wasn't so good. Hmm. So hmm. now they're soloing, and, and, we're, and the musicians are, it's called winnowing. Yes. They were winnowing down to the cats that could really do something for three and a half minutes without making a mistake. Well, I have a big problem. No, so anyway, I that's... Uh... Rusty Young, rest in peace. We just lost him from Poco. Yeah, he said that he left the studios because of that reason. Because really, after a while, people just wanted to play you to play it safe. I mean, David Spinoza hit a clam on Right Place, Wrong Time. Doctor John uh -huh. and Arif Marden were like, he's like, yeah, let me do it again. They're like, no, you're done. And then and then yeah. you know you're done. And 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 then all of a sudden, Rusty was like. Rusty was saying that like, so like those things were part of the, of the recording process. Like it might be, it, you wouldn't, there are no wrong notes, but then after a while it became, okay, we just want to play it safe. We want to bring in people. If, if you made a mistake, it'd be like public shaming. And basically they just wanted you to fill a sonic space and not play yourself. And th that to well, me, not, yeah. not at the time that, that I was recording. Absolutely. That was, yeah. that was not true. That's exactly right. Well, uh, I, I just I, I want to I would I just want to uh, pardon me for interrupting you uh, before yeah. I forget my thought. Um, on let's get it on. That that wonderful day when Motown called me and said, "Hey, come on over to the to the studio on Romaine Street," and I went in and Renee Hall was the arranger, a fabulous guitar player, and we were rehearsing, and Renee Hall said, "Hey, Don, listen, make up something at the beginning." And I had just gotten my crybaby wah wah pedal, <laughs> and, and I did wah 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 wah, and that's the beginning. That of That is so freak on. unreal. That, that that I mean. But if yeah, you listen, yeah. fifteen seconds in, I make a terrible mistake, and I hit the open G string, and it went wah, and you can hear it if you turn it up, right as Marvin starts singing, about the second phrase, you'll hear this. I go dee 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 down now and then and then you hear blah and that's really left me. That was me. That's it. That's what I was looking for, man. I, I just I I think I think that you just I mean I'm I, I am blown away by this. I mean to me it's that's what the magic was. It was about the feel. If it felt good, who cares? Leave it in. Nobody's gonna notice anyway. And now well, that efficiency model came in, and I also wanted to ask you, was the love that you had for each other, you know, picking yourselves up, working as a team, <clears throat> because... Going was, out to lunch. Wasn't it because there was just so enough work to go around that everybody, nobody was starving to death? Uh, well, look, in all fairness we would go down to the musicians union to pick up our checks in those days. Yeah. And we would stand in line and it was embarrassing. Tommy Tedesco would get a fucking, you know, a heap of checks. Howard Roberts would get a bunch of checks. I'd get a bunch of checks. And then there'd be a couple of guys that were getting one check and it was kind of embarrassing. 
yeah. you know, there was a lot of work, but, you know, they were looking for a particular sound or a particular ability, and and it was, you know, some guys didn't get a, a lot of work. Totally. Just, no, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, we're talking Shelton, you, and David T. You guys were getting, so what I'm saying is that it wasn't, there so wasn't we a... Were doing three, yeah, we were doing three sessions a day. Oh, dude, you were you were coming in before the sun came up, and you were leaving when the yep. before, when the you never even saw the sun. Yeah, I mean, that's right. And that's and right. so I mean, that to me is well, and then the cost of living. I mean, L.A. City College, you didn't even have to pay; you paid for a parking space. I think it was free. I mean, it was like you know, the cost of living was yep. not nearly. It was not crushing, and you guys were able to get ahead. I remember talking to Blaine, and I was like, you know. You know, Peter Asher was the first one to kind of introduce a company as credits on the back of records. Before that, it was just yes. like yes. like Brian Wilson would get credit for playing drums on a Beach Boys record. And I said, Hal, if that was my generation, people would be having a fit. You know, they, they'd want the credit yeah. if they were playing the drums. And I said, why weren't you getting insecure about that? He's like, you know, man. All of us, and I'm talking about Julius Wechter, Emil, uh, Jimmy, bon, uh, Jimmy Bond, uh, Tedesco. He's like, we all saw our, we all saw our families moving up. We were all driving nice cars. We were all buying nice houses. It didn't matter. We were make. It was a profession. And I guess that's all yeah. I'm saying is that you realize now that for my generation and younger, I mean, societally, um. A lot of people view music as a musician's gift to the world. And so you have this malarkey out there like, oh, you can pay to play or you can play for the door. And then obviously there's this whole idea of mechanization of music with machine parts and all this other stuff. But it's like it's so that's why I just love hearing like to talk. to. I mean, I love you, Dean Parks, Louie. I mean, Danny Korchmar. I mean, I you know, it just it. I I cannot let my show I will never stop until you know the cyclical nature of music comes around again because um that love doesn't well, exist that do, that love doesn't exist right now because there's no work to go around and it's just it, yeah. you know and that's the humbling part the only way you can make music now don is by road dogging it and you know what you don't even get paid well for the you never got paid that great for the gigs but now the merch table is what helps these cats get by. You don't have any, intele- there's no intellectual property rights and, and there's no studio scene. So anyway, I, uh, I, I got, you're one for one with voices. I, I got another name that voice for Don peak. And, uh, Uh-oh. and I, 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 I this is, we'll see if you can get this one and then we'll, we'll come back. Okay. The first label that I worked for, it was called motif records. It was owned by one of the ten richest men in the state of California, and he was a complete drunk. <laughs> it was a tax thing. Right. And it gave him an office to go to every day where he could sit and drink. Uh, he carried a briefcase all the time, and I always wondered what was in it. And after I'd been there about six or seven months, I had to bring the briefcase in, and I opened it and glanced in, and it had two bottles of two quarts of scotch. Of course. <laughs> Johnny Walker, of course. <laughs> Always the best for Mr. Vetter. But he owned, he had Motif Records? Is that Yes, yeah, okay. he owned it. And what album? It was a tax write-off. Oh, I just did, did he, he didn't know about it. You know, I was doing a, I cut a couple of albums with Gerald Wiggins. Sure. And Wig was like probably one of the best pianists in the country. He really was. He should have been much bigger than he was. But Gerald had a problem, and that problem was himself. You never knew which Gerald Wiggins you were going to get. He was my mentor. I met him in 1952, and we were inseparable for years. And when I got the job at Capitol, he was so glad because he figured I was going to use him all the time, and I did. But then one night, we were recording Lou Rawls. He pulled that Gerald Wiggins stuff on me. I never thought he'd do that. He did it to everybody else. What I mean by that is that he, you know, he didn't, he wasn't really being Gerald Wiggins. He would just do what he needed to do, and that was it. 
Mr. Peak, do you know who that is? God, it's so familiar, but I can't name it. Oh, I thought you were going to get it 100%. That is your old comrade. And I am so humbled to have done maybe the only radio interview with him that's out in circulation. The legendary David Axelrod. Oh, the axe. The axe, dude. I mean, dude, I could not believe that you, I mean, those albums that you're on with him are like the funkiest. I mean, you came up in the funkiest time ever. Axe was crazy. Axe was a, he he did his first album. One of his first albums was Harold Land, The Fox. Um, yeah. I mean, when did you cross paths with, um, I know he was very close. You just talking about Gerald Wiggins there, but like, when did you, you know, and even David T, it was revelatory to me because I mean, I'm sure someone's got stock f- film of this, but Cannonball had his own nightly, he had a, he had a, a weekend, uh, night, uh, show with, and the band was Jim Huart, John Guerin, uh, David T and can and Cannon. Cannon would interview cats and then he would, and then they would wow. play some tunes. When did you become, obviously you were embraced by the cats going back to the Minneapolis days. They were taking you to South Minneapolis, but I mean, when did you cross paths with, <clears throat> with Cannon? Because Cannon, Cannon, like he doesn't get overlooked, but he died too young and he yeah, was like oh, the most freaking amazing. I mean, this one album has, Early 70s has, like, George Duke, Walter Booker, Roy McCurdy, Ayerto, Buck Clark, and Mike Dacey on guitar. I mean, Cannon, <laughs> Cannon was tr- – yeah, I mean, Cannon was trying to, to heal the world through music. When did you first connect with him? I connected with him the first time because Axelrod hired me to fly up to, to Oakland to Fantasy Records – to start playing on some records. Oh my God. And oh my God. Yeah. One of the records was, you know, we did some of those albums and then uh, we did a couple in LA and then started playing up at Fantasy. And that's when we did Cannonball and, and Nat Adderley's album called Big Man. You're on that out. I do, you know, I've always kind of, that one's like heavily produced with strings and stuff, but you're on that? Well, I, yeah, I've got it here. I've got the, it's a, it's a two. I think it's a two vinyl. Yeah, dude. I, it's um, one of the few that I've really. And tell me about that experience. Were you? Was that a? Was that? First of all, my buddy, dear friend of mine. I'm not sure if you really ever connected with him. Was the engineer Jim Stern? Did you know Jim? No, not really. Yeah. So he he uh, he was the 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 guy at Fantasy. By the time you got up there, he had he literally had rewired and rewalled all of Fantasy Records. But can you talk about like? You did you did, was did you overdub on that? I mean, what was the recording process? Oh, no, 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 no. There, we don't, we didn't overdub. Okay. <laughs> and and it's kind of I don't mean to get my hackles up, but you know I when I did Let's Get It On, Wawa Watson went on the road with Marvin, and everybody assumed that Wawa Watson played the beginning of Let's Get It On, but he did not. I did. Wow. But I am so this is why off. I do my show, man. Go ahead, continue. I was the white guy and they left my name off the record. Later on, about 18 years later, Motown called me and said, "Listen, we're we're going to put you on the album, give you the credit you deserve." But when Wawa passed away, and he was my buddy. I, mean, I went to his house and played pool with him. You know, Wawa and Ray Parker Jr. and myself oh, did all of Barry White records. Oh, my God. You know, the just, young, unreal. Love Unlimited. Dude, that, that the, the, I'm, I'm literally, my daughters and I, the Together Brothers soundtrack, That's I'm going home tonight to listen to that. That's all Don Pete. Uh, it's unreal. Uh, Un, I mean, you, hold on for a second, though. Because um, I want to be clear. I remember... You know, I, I tend to shy away from like the uh, like the, like the Trouble Man soundtrack. That that's like my pocket of Marvin. But like, let's get it on. Like I remember opening the gatefold, and I can't remember if it was a Tamla release or Motown, whatever. What, but I saw your name in the credits on the vinyl of the original. You're telling me the original vinyl. You're not. Yeah. You're not. What, what is it? What it? It gives credit to who? Who does it give credit to? It, it, it doesn't doesn't give credit to anybody. I don't think, unless I'm mistaken. But but it took years for me to finally get 
you know, what, what we call my propers. Well, and, and I want to be also clear, like if you can, tr- like that opening part to let's get it on, like at that, I know today if, if like Louis was telling me that when he did last train to Clarksville at the time, um, he, the guitar, if you, if the guitar solo had a major impact on the song, you would not get publishing credits for it. And that changed, yeah. but, but would you, would that you, would you, would you, would you have gotten publishing at that time when let's get it on? No. You wouldn't no. have. Okay. Now, nowadays, I would have been a songwriter on the song. Absolutely. You would have been D, D peak. Yeah, D peak. D peak. Unbelievable, dude. And so you're the white yeah. guy, so they dismiss. This is why I had. Oh, man. I feel just. So, you know, and I, I, I thank you to Dean Parks because he was riffing one day about Louis Shelton and, and Don Peak. And I'm like, oh, my God, dude. I haven't. I have so much more to get. I have. I mean, you, <laughs> <laughs> I mean. What was it about? No, listen, I have to tell you, I have to interrupt you. Because go ahead. We can't go another further until I tell you. Go ahead. That when I went to, to play at Fantasy Records, they put me up at a little hotel. And I was having lunch before I went to the session to play with Cannonball. And the waitress was a college student. And she came over and said, are you finished? I said, yeah, what do you got for dessert? And she said, well, we have apple pie with cherry pie and barbarian cream pie. And I said, excuse me, could you repeat that? And she said, apple pie, cherry pie, and barbarian cream pie. And I wrote that down in the margin of the book that I was reading. She, she did not know what Bavarian cream pie was. <laughs> and she, she was this little, little white girl going to college up in Berkeley, I guess. Well, that was, that, that was Bar- so, I mean... That's a, uh, barbarian cream pie, baby. Barbarian, b- not Bavarian, but barbarian. Right. Um, By the way, yeah. How much uh, longer are we going to go? We're, no, we're going to have to do set two. I, I'd say another five. Can we do set two? I, another. We got another five minutes, maybe. Five minutes is fine. Okay, but we, we we can pick up and do another another set, right? Oh, sure. Okay, great. Um, uh, can you talk about? Uh, the most effective qualities of leadership that you believe are essential on the bandstand or in the studio when everybody's hitting live? Well, first of all, it's really important to understand that the the room sound, the sound of all of us leaking into our, each other's microphones is part of the sound. That's Absolutely. You, you must record together. Um, but besides that... I ended up being the composer on Knight Rider and doing 77 of the 88 episodes. Oh my God. And I was the leader. I was up on this. Uh, I studied conducting with a great conductor, and I studied orchestration with Albert Harris, and I studied with Paul Glass, and I became a composer and a conductor. And I got a lot of credit because when I was up on that podium, I was treating the players like I was still one of the players. Right. A good chief has to be a good Indian, too. I dig. Oh, absolutely. And the same in boats. You know, I, I'm, I'm a sailor, and and I can be the skipper, or I can be the crew, whatever you need. I can't believe... When was the last time you talked to Henry Franklin? Uh, a few months ago. Oh, good. I, I mean, I am... It touches my... Can you talk about... Uh, to me, he's one of the m- most ridiculous players I've ever heard, and, and he kind of flies below that uh you know ron carter sort of name recognition but i mean skipper is the i mean dude that dude is a beast man oh he is and he's solid you know he's just solid leroy vinegar was quoted once somebody said to him but how do you do it leroy and he said roots and fifths baby (laughs) did you go to the it club to see like ahmad and dexter gordon and those cats no, but I went. I went a lot to the you know when when Shelley Mann had the manhole. Then I would go down to South L.A. Bill Green. Do you remember William Green? God, I I mean that. Who is that? He's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful man with a very deep voice, who played saxophone and flute. And the video on the there's a movie called the T, Tammy T A M I show. It's a it's a 
it's a, a like a DVD mm-hmm. of, a, of a movie. It's a movie. And I'm playing with Ray Charles, and Bill Green is right up in front, and I'm sitting just with Brother Ray, and the rest of the band is up on the stage. And when we do Georgia, that's Bill Green who does those beautiful, you know, fills. And he took me down to the south side. I, I started studying with him at a school up in the Hollywood Hills. There's a place called the Anson Ford Theater. Wow. And it's right across from the Hollywood Bowl, right across the canyon. And there used to be a jazz school up there, and I would study with Bill Green. I was the only guitar player. Everybody else was saxophone. But I was the only guitar player in the room. And Bill Green would say, okay, everybody, bobo do be do bo dat and we'd all go, ba ba do ba do ba da <laughs> And so he would, and they'd say, okay, now, ba ba do ba da ba ba do da ba do ba do ba And we would all play that. So, so I was in the room with all these sax players, and Bill Green would take me down to Marty's at 41st and Broadway. And I, he'd bought, uh, invite me up on the stage, and, and it was like, Art Hillary was playing organ. Whoa, whoa, and dude, these, you're dropping these, some serious, I don't even know who these cats are, yeah. man. Oh well, these are the cats. Well, what about Con- and, Charles Kennard, man? Did you did you hang with that cat? No, I did not. Oh my god! But it means duck. It, it means duck in French. <laughs> what what is what what means duck? Canard is a duck. A canard. Yeah. Okay. So 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 he would because like yeah, the, Mel Brown was playing down there. Like a bunch of crazy blues players were playing down there. But this was a jazz gig. This was wow. a serious up tempo jazz gig, and, and I could hardly keep up. But Bill Green kept bringing me up on stage to play with them. That was the kind of mentoring that I got, where I was allowed to sit in with people and play. And, you know, and this, as you say, this was before everybody played it safe. This is when, when people would just get up and, and do what they could do. Uh, Don Peake, I could. I mean, I, I want you to take the boat out today. I think the waters are going to be in great shape for you today. You can fly. <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah, let's try to do set two next week, man. I, I've got a lot more to get to, and I, I mean, we just cooked for just about an hour here, but um, let's try to put it together, okay? I would love it, and I'm thrilled that that you know the people that I know. Yeah, well, no, I mean, dude, I'm on a sacred journey. You guys are, to me, some of the last authentic leaders and also experienced all the generosity of the guys that came before you. And um, it's absolutely essential for the cyclical nature of spiritual music that this inf- this is not preservation. This is promotion, man, because we are, the vibration is lower than it's ever been. And there's a reason why there's mass insanity going on. And it's it's a direct correlation to the to the lack of human music and then, coronavirus has shut down the entire domestic touring circuit so and anyway, we've got a lot more to get to man so bless you have All a right. great weekend man bless you too and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all right did, did, did you i mean do you feel like you told some stories maybe for the first time today some some new stuff yes yes yeah yeah and also jay graydon called me the other day yeah you know jake jake the rake and we got to talk about Jay Graydon next time. Well, no, you know, and you know, the key, the key is that you got to, he, you know, he, he's been ducking. I got to get to Graydon too. You got to put in a good word for me, all right? No, well, I will. Yeah, I no. will. All right, yeah. Much love, Peak. Take it easy, man. Okay, brother. Talk God to you bless. soon. Yeah, bless you, man. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. What a wonderful day here on the Jake Feinberg show. It's always a wonderful day, but uh, <clears throat> heard from Seth Walker and his new book. Your van is on fire, and just talk to an incredible gentleman, an amazing uh, guitarist, Don Peak. That's it for the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you when we see you. Until then, peace.